Today I'm going to talk about right heart catheterization. It's going to be a very basic talk about right heart catheterization and most of you might already know what we will be talking but it's just like a refresher. Um, some of the things like peripheral vascular resistance, SVR, we might talk about them separately when we might be talking about pulmonary hypertension and heart failure. So to put it together, uh, the right heart catheterization to measure hemodynamics. Routine right heart catheterization is class 3 that you are putting the patient to harm. But if the patient has got advanced heart failure uh, or you're not aware, or you're not uh, able to decide what's the volume of status of the patient, then the right heart catheterization can be, con uh, can be considered. This is the PA catheter. This is how it can look like. It comes in six, seven, and eight French. The the seven French is usually what we call like a VIP goes through, through goes through an eight French sheet. It's got a balloon and an atrial port, so right atrial port, and the tip there is a transducer that transduces the pressure waveform, and it's fitted with a balloon. So the right heart catheterization can be done through the IJ subclavian brachial or femoral axis in this case we're going to start with a right heart catheterization through the right ij it's a straight shot the catheter comes through the svc and into the right atrium you have the balloon fitted at the near the tip that's going to allow the catheter to go along with the blood flow so once the catheter is in the right atrium, if you see below, this is the right atrial waveform that you will see. And the pressures can be somewhere between 0 to 5 millimeter of mercury. As you push the catheter down, it goes through the tricuspid valve and reaches the right ventricle. Once in the right ventricle, you will see the waveform change significantly as in this waveform you will see upstroke and downstroke without any notch and the diastolic pressure should ideally be equal to the right atrial pressure so putting it together the systolic pressure in the right ventricle can be somewhere between 15 to 20 and the diastolic as we said could be close to the right atrial pressure and this is how the waveform will look like as we saw down in the graph. It's going to delete this here. Next, you push the catheter into the RVOT. And again, since the balloon is inflated, the catheter follows the flow of the blood and it goes across the pulmonic valve. Again, the waveform will change. Now you will have a PA systolic pressure which can be somewhere close to the right ventricle systolic pressure. In this case could be around 20 to 25. But in this case the diastolic pressure will be slightly higher. Can be around 5 to 10. And that is because the pulmonic valve closes and it does not allow the diastolic pressure to go down to the diastolic pressure of the right ventricle. If you look at the waveform, once the catheter is in the PA, you will see again, as I said, the diastolic pressure will be slightly higher than the right ventricle diastolic and diastolic pressures. And you will see this little notch here. And that is where you see the pulmonic valve closing. So you see this little hump here that signifies, okay, the PA catheter is in the uh, pulmonary artery. Now you're going to keep pushing the catheter up unless, until you find a small pulmonary artery where you can wedge it. And once you wedge the catheter, you will see what we call like a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And it's somewhere could be around 10 to 12. And that is the wedge pressure that we measure. So let's see how the wedge pressure works. So you have the PA catheter here. 
it is all wedged the balloon is obstructing any blood to go into this small branch the assumption is all the blood distilled to that catheter is now static all the way to the left atrium so the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is an indirect way of measuring the left atrial pressure why is it important because the wedge pressure is an indirect measurement of left ventricular and diastolic pressure which is the pressure that we want to know especially in patients who got heart failure so in order to get a wedge pressure you are doing a lot of assumptions number one you are assuming that the catheter that you put in the pulmonary artery is wedged nicely so there is no blood going across that balloon number one number two you are assuming that this whole column of blood from this catheter tip all the way to the left atrium is static imagine if there is any pulmonary artery or venous malformation or fistula the wedge will be erroneous or there will be an error in the wedge similarly if the left atrium is severely dilated it might not be the same as the left ventricular and diastolic pressure and the last but not the least is your mitral valve so we are assuming that is end diastolic in end diastolic where the valve is open the pressure in the lv is equal to the pressure in the left atrium is equal to the pressure in this column of blood and that is transduced by the catheter and that's what we see as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure so putting it together the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is an indirect way of measuring the left ventricular and diastolic pressure and you assume a lot of things the catheter is in wedge position the column of blood is static there is no arterial venous malformation left atrium is not dilated and while you are looking at the the wedge pressure the valve the mitral valve is in open position and that is when we what we call like a um, during wedge tracing we want to look at the ekg and we call it like we call it and exploratory so basically what the idea is if you draw a line from the p wave on the ekg the point where it crosses the wedge tracing is your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure because we know at the p wave is where you have the left atrium contracting or starting to contract while the valve is open so if we would have a non invasive way of knowing the left ventricular and diastolic pressure we should we would not have been bothering about the right heart catheterization at all echo in some cases can give you a left ventricular and diastolic pressure by some of the waveform doppler waveforms but that's not accurate or the other way would be to do a left heart catheterization you go into the arterial system all the way into the left ventricle and measure the left ventricle and diastolic pressure so these were the the tracing that we talked about the ra rv pa and the wedge tracings now we're going to talk about the cardiac output how do we measure the cardiac output obviously you want to know not only the hemodynamics but you also want to know what's the contractility of the heart what's the cardiac output what's the cardiac index because that's going to help guide you the next management so there are two methods thermodilution method and the fick method for calculating the cardiac output and index you have to know that i know we do most of the time both of them you might have seen me doing one and i usually rely on the fick method or fick cardiac output that is because none of them are perfect it all depends on which one do you trust more thermodilution method to me has more errors as compared to the fick method so i usually go with the fick but we're going to talk about both thermodilution and the fick 
because in some instances the fic might not be accurate and we will talk about that. So the basic idea about the thermal dilution method is you inject a cold saline or dextrose through a syringe. Somebody has to steadily inject that. That cold fluid comes out of the right atrium, flows to the tip of the catheter. Here you have a temperature sensor and the time it takes for this cold saline or dextrose to reach that sensor is plotted on a graph and we measure what we call like an area under the curve and the computer gives you the cardiac output. Since it's not very accurate, there are a lot of things that they, that can go wrong. So that's why you have to do it three times and you get an average. So let's see here what happens in the right atrium. So if this right atrial port is here, you inject the fluid, comes out here, goes across the tricuspid valve into the pulmonary artery and here at the tip of the swan catheter you have the sensor. So imagine there are so many things that, that, that can go wrong. For example, if the tricuspid valve has a lot of regurgitation, all will happen is this fluid going to keep circulating from here to there and you might not get an accurate result. Imagine if the patient has got a PFO. Again, this fluid might go just directly into the left atrium. So number two, that can contribute towards the error. Number three, if the patient is having fever. If the patient is already having fever, this method might not be accurate. So we talked about tricuspid regurgitation. There might be some kind of a shunt. If the patient is having fever, and last but not the least, who is injecting the, the fluid. If it is a tech, they do it all the time. They are usually very good, but you have to know sometimes they might be pushing it harder it's, if, it's a, if it is the end of the day or um, you know they might push it too quickly. So that can also contribute towards the error. And for all these reasons, I usually don't like the thermal dilution method. Let's come to the FIC method. Again, the FIC method is a very old method has been in practice since 1910, so almost a century old, but still it's good to give you an idea of what's going on with the cardiac output and the cardiac index. The basic idea of, of the FIC cardiac method is how much of the oxygen is taken up by the body or the cell in a minute per square meter of the body surface area, and I will come to that. So what do we need for the FIC method? We need arterial saturation. We need the PA oxygen saturation. So basically what we are looking at is when the arterial saturation, let's say here it is 99% saturated, it goes across, the capillaries comes back into the PA. What's the PA saturation here? So if it is 60%, the PSI is 50%, 60%, about 29% of the, of the oxygen is taken up by the cells. Again, there are a lot of things that you assume in the FIC method as well. And one of them is the body surface area. We don't usually look at the patients. We use a set number, and that is 125 ml of oxygen per minute per meter body surface area. And for the sake of simplicity, we consider all our patients to be having a body surface area of two meters square. So that ends up 250 ml of oxygen per minute per, uh, per patient or for, of, of two square meter body surface area. So basically the idea of the fake cardiac output method is what's the oxygen saturation at the arterial end? What's the oxygen saturation at the venous end? You kind of minus that and then you put these, what's their body surface area and you get the number, the cardiac output. So what are the conditions where you will have a low 
cardiac output. Obviously, if the patient has got heart failure. If the patient has got a heart failure, you will have a low FIC number of cardiac output and cardiac in index. What if the patient is in cardiogenic shock? That is one indication condition where you will have low cardiac index. But for example, if the patient is cold, hypothermic, for some other reason, so what will happen is these all capillaries will all be constricted. Or if the patient is on pressors, what will happen is the blood will go very slowly. There will be a very sluggish flow across these capillaries. And by the time this blood will reach the PA, the saturation will be low and you will calculate a cardiac index which will be low. That's one thing. Reverse will be the other way. For example, if the patient has got fever and all these capillaries are dilated, all the blood will be just shunted across this capillary band. The cells will not have enough time to extract the oxygen and you will have a falsely elevated cardiac output in patients who got septic shock or fever. One last thing that I want to mention here, and that is very important, is when I am using the FIC cardiac output, I always look at two things. One is, do they have any kind of a communication between the arterial or the venous end? For example, if they are dialysis patient, if they are dialysis patient, they might have a fistula. So if they have a fistula, the blood is just gonna get shunted from the arterial to the venous system. And that's when I go back to my thermodilution method of cardiac output and index. Similarly, if they have known arterial venous malformation, then also you want to use the thermodilution method, not the FIC method. Last but not the least is in patients who got LVAD. We know they also develop over a period of time arterial venous malformation, so the FIC method might not be accurate in these patients as well. So we'll stop here, and then, as I said, the SVR, the PVR will topic will cover in the different topics.